sculptors are transforming condemned elm, ash, and locust trees in Chicago's parks. Artists through Chicago Sculpture International have teamed up with the Chicago Park District to select trees offering an unusual canvas for artists to create their concepts. Our urban landscape is compromised with invasive insects and disease damaging our elms and ash trees. Parkway trees are recycling our carbon dioxide fumes and providing oxygen, but getting stressed out in the chlorophyll process. An estimated 100,000 trees will die in Chicago parks in the next few years. Removal and replacement will be expensive. These sculptures and trees draw attention to the fact that our trees are living condemned and pay tribute to their decades or centuries of life. Chicago sculptors are recreating trees for a variety of reasons. Some want to draw attention to the large amount of trees dying. Some want to say this is urban nature. Some want to create a symbol of new hope, shelter, and food for animal life. Some want to remind others to reduce their carbon footprint, ease your foot off the pedal. All artists perched in these branches are making a statement in this unique medium. My name is Mia Capitolupo and my piece right now is untitled, but it has to do with bringing synthetic elements found in the city and um, in an urban environment and combining them with the natural environment or the natural environment as we experience it in the city, which is also very planned and man-made. You know, since we're dealing with dying or already dead kind of trees, um, what sort of environmental, maybe, um, issues come to mind um, when thinking about the project, um, your project in particular? Well, I feel, I'm a little concerned about it, um, just because I do, I realize it is a habitat still, and it's still growing, so that challenge is really different, too, to take mm -hmm. into account birds, you know, like going to the site and seeing the tree and seeing how animals were interacting with it. Hi, I'm Ron Gard, and I'm a member of Chicago Sculpture International, and we're currently involved with the Chicago Park District on a project we're calling the Tree Project, where we're utilizing the ash borer, the trees that are dying of ash borer disease that are coming down, and they contacted us to try to turn these trees into sculptures. So there's I think at this point there's going to be 15 sculptures by the end of the summer and I was very excited about this because I, I work in the film business as well and I have uh, done a couple of trees for movies so it was a perfect project for me. Will saving 10, 15 or 20 trees save Chicago's urban garden? The sculpted trees are selected from parks throughout Chicago giving a ripple effect to artists' expressions throughout many neighborhoods. The thing about this design that I think will be entertaining is it won't be uh, you know, immediately uh, noticeable, but people will be walking by this tree and they'll say, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? And, and uh, that's, that'll be kind of the uh, little bit of the intrigue of it. The Morse Code, dealing with um, the trees and how I felt about the trees, and we thought it was a good idea to incorporate some of Indira's designs as well as my designs on this uh, ash tree that, um, as I mentioned before, the one we chose was very totem-like. So with the SOS pattern that I carved in this piece of maple trunk, it uh, starts out with the dot, 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 dash, 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 and then continues around dot, dot, dot. I'm Margo McMahon. I'm working on a sculpture called Flock, which are, will be larger than life songbirds flying through an elm tree that has died along Lakeshore Drive south of 57th Street. The birds are carved out of a tree that was 300 years old and blew over in hurricane force winds off of Lake Michigan. Uh, that it's made of this material means something. 
Uh, and if winds like that are blowing over trees, what is happening to the birds? That's the concept of my piece. Uh, I'm an environmentalist who works with sculpture. I like the object of sculpture. And I work with uh, human, plant, and animal forms to show how we are all living creatures on this earth and we're all interconnected. Um, I've chosen to carve in wood for this exhibit uh, because it's about the trees and the meaning of working in that wood to express the life of a tree, to extend the life of this elm that I've been um, given, seems to create a good cycle. Uh, my name is Nicolette Ross. Uh, my tree is located in Washington Park at 5200 Payne. Um, the concept for my tree um, is derived from my woodcutting experience. Um, I do a lot of woodcut for making, and I'm going to be carving a basket weave pattern of the trunk of the tree um, to mimic uh, some kind of weaving, uh, embracing the tree trunk. Uh, my name is Mark Schneider, and uh, the, I haven't really come up with a, a title for my piece yet. Uh, I, I typically wait till uh, I'm done with it, and then I uh, and then something kind of comes to me as, as, as far as a name. Uh, it is in Bessemer Park, which is 8300 South in the city of Chicago. Um, my concept is to build a, a big giant birdhouse uh, made out of pretty much mostly natural materials um, it's like grapevines and tree bark, tree limbs. Um, that's mostly what, what I use and I uh, hold, hold fasten it together with, with uh, different nails and screws. Because it's going to be kind of a big piece and it will have a bunch of like little kind of compartments or spots in it and so I am just hoping something will find a home in there. Hi, I'm Vivian Visser. I do sculpture about our spiritual and psychological relationship with nature. I'm really excited about this project. I don't know which tree I have yet, um, but I'm going to do a piece about um, structures in nature, uh, cells, uh, honeycombs, seed pods, uh, cocoons, all of those forms and I'm going to do an enlarged version in a tree and I think that when we walk through nature very often we don't see what's right in front of us so I hope my work will help people to stop and take notice and make associations between the artwork and the nature around it. Cheryl Williams and the proposed image to do in the park uh, for tree art is called Tree Hook. Market Park is where the sculpture tree art is going to be uh, created. A group of Chicagoans explored the various parks while artists were working yeah. on their trees in phase one of the tree project. Ride with us to spot sculpted trees. Five more trees will be sculpted in the fall, several more next summer. Chicago sculptors who are showcase, showcasing their artistic statements in Chicago's parks' dead trees. 90,000 trees are expected to die in the next few years, causing a huge financial burden to remove and replace our CO2 oxygen renewing canopy. Sit back, relax, and enjoy tech sculptures in the next hour. <laughs> In 1871, South and West Park Commissions acquired 1,055 acres of land just south of Chicago's southern border. They hired Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux to design what was originally South Park and is now called Jackson Park in Washington Park, linked by Midway Plaisance. Olmsted believed that parks should provide release from urban tensions as well as serve as democratic places. 
This plan for Washington Park is realized. What is the ecological advantage of keeping live condemned trees in our parks? Insect and beetle larvae thrive on the bark and wood, becoming nutrients for wildlife. Woodpeckers, flickers, chickadees thrive on the insects. Microclimate communities of plants grow under the dead trees. Nesting birds and wildlife need the trees for a safe haven. Migrating birds need a safe harbor to feed and rest along the Lake Michigan Flyway. Mushrooms, fungi, and mold grow in the decaying trees, contributing to the ecosystem in dynamic, mysterious, and microbiotic ways. Sculpting them draws attention to their own natural grandeur. Jackson Park had few improvements before being selected as the site for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Olmsted worked with Daniel Burnham to transform the swampy area into the White City. Olmsted believed that Jackson Park's relationship with Lake Michigan was its greatest asset. He interpreted the lake as a tremendous object of sublime scenery. With water as the guiding theme, Olmsted and Vogue designed a rugged series of lagoons linking Lake Michigan to Washington Park through the middle of Midway Plaisance. Their compositions combined shadowy winding paths, which created a sense of mystery or anxiety, with beautiful graceful elements like broad sunny meadows for calming visitors. At Washington Park, the south open green conveyed the firm's beautiful style. Taylor Wallace. Uh, I'm a sculptor for Chicago Sculpture International, and uh, we're doing a reductive process on this uh, locust tree here. Um, essentially, we go in um, with the tools, do a long striation, and then try to work back to it. And it's going to be an undulating groove pattern, um, kind of like a spiral uh, to uh, the sky. So yeah. I don't know. What, uh, what else you want to know? way to go you see it's like 35 feet tall so uh, you know this will be the easy part on the bottom we'll kind of rough it out and um, get an approach uh, for the process and then by the time we get to the top hopefully it's more streamlined so you don't have to do a lot of figuring out on the on the ladder successor companies Olmsted Brothers and DH Burnham company then designed 14 neighborhood parks for the south side among the first new sites was McGuane Park, opened in 1905. Armour Square, Hamilton, Ogden, and Sherman Parks were other innovative facilities. These small parks offered the first Chicago library, English lessons, hot meals, free public bathing facilities, and health services. President Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed them the most notable achievement in any American city. By 1934, these parks were consolidated into the Chicago Park District and over $100 million of improvements were made through the WPA. In 
In the 1800s, Julius Robert Mayer, a surgeon, recognized nature has solved the problem of how to catch in flight light streaming to the earth and store this most elusive of all powers in rigid form. Chicago Sculpture International advances the understanding and creation of sculpture as a unique and vital contribution to society. The CSI seeks to expand public understanding and appreciation of Chicago sculpture through exhibits and public forums on sculpture to engage artists and art professionals in a dialogue to advance the art form and to promote a supportive environment for sculpture and sculptors. CSI currently includes 140 members and is only one of three United States chapters of the International Sculpture Center, a New Jersey-based association serving the field of sculpture in its various forms. With both outdoor and indoor exhibition committees, CSI has several exhibitions annually to showcase contemporary sculpture throughout the Midwest. And uh, in the 1830s, Chicago's emerging government adopted the, the motto, Herbs e Horto, a Latin phrase meaning city in a garden. Climate change is the big issue. Uh, Chicago's on the verge of changing its growing zone. Um, and with that, we will have some plants that will no longer be able to grow here and others that will come in. Some species of birds will no longer nest here. We're going through change so fast that it's affecting human beings, it's affecting animal life, and it's affecting uh, plant life also. And we need to know that all these systems are, are being stressed at the same time. I'm focusing on the birds while we're bringing attention to the trees that are dying. That interrelationship means something to me and that a human bird being made that sculpture brings human, plant, and animal life together. Um, for the ecosystem, that we need to be more engaged in helping the earth to heal. And by putting these birds flying through a dead tree along Lakeshore Drive, people will say, why the birds? That tree's dead. Uh, what can I do this year or this day to curb some of my uh, CO2 emissions that I put into the air. Drive a little slower, uh, use a little bit more lo local food. Think about how we can change every day to help the earth to heal. Like the singing canary in a coal mine, birds have been an indicator of unsafe living conditions. Remember the peregrine falcon and bald eagle population decline that caused us to understand that our underregulated pesticide habits were poisoning the environment and us? They are off the endangered species list now, and we are healthier. Today, the meadowlark and bobwhites have lost half their population due to loss of grass buffers and cow pastures on small-scale farms. Alongside the loss of grassland, indicated by less birds, soil runoff is clogging nearby rivers and lakes. Insect-eating birds like nighthawks are reduced in population, along with bees, due to insecticides. The majestic California condor and elegant gray-blue heron are once again gracing our children's lives. 
we can view these birds as an indicator of reclaimed health in our land and water. The largest Illinois nesting flock of black heron returns each year to Lincoln Park. The birds have returned to the same grove of trees for decades to hatch and raise their fledglings. The trees are dying under their nests with weak branches snapping, causing the nests to fall. In the 2014 winter, naturalists removed some of the most compromised trees from the grove, hoping a portion of the flock will build nests nearby. In the spring, several nests were built further north near a pond in a healthier row of trees. This is an example of conservation and nature working together to compensate for the grove dying from stresses due to climate change. The trunks age and die, and new ones come up, but the roots are ancient. Hi, Mark. Hi. So this is my tree, and uh, we're going to build a big birdhouse. You can see that, that little fork up there, it's going to be kind of centered around that. And so it has a little uh, gas cartridge, or gas cartridge and a battery, and uh, she yeah. Debating on what to do, and then uh, I, I, it just really struck me because we're, we're real close to the lake, we're getting a nice lake breeze, and I, you know, I always think of the environment and the invasive species, and so it's kind of uh, going to be a, a fish. Some sticks kind of like this, and so these will, will go up on that little uh, trunk there. Uh, pass them on there a couple of things and then I'm going to cover the, this whole part with bark. Uh, well, you know, one thing that really came to me while I was down here is, um, you know, the Asian carp getting into Lake Michigan, and, you know, and, and it's not that far from here. about naming it something, you know, in honor of uh, Herman 
Fungi growth rots the wood, offering another food source. 611,000 species of mold, fungi, and mushrooms are known and labeled. We have yet to find and identify 86% of plants and animals on land. Teeming inside of these condemned trees is an unknown world unto itself. For instance, a thread-like fungi, mycorrhizal, has an underground symbiotic relationship with roots supply the fungi with sugars or energy from their leaves. 95% of all plant species have roots coated with this fibrous fungi, a secondary root system. The fungi attaches and grows beyond the roots, drawing essential nutrients and moisture from beyond the reach of the roots to nourish the host tree. The most fascinating findings show that these fungi actually form a deep underground network that communicates between trees. Warnings of drought might make a whole grove curl its blossoms and leaves to preserve water. The oldest tree serves as a mother tree, with the younger trees growing within her network. The mother tree sends carbon, nitrogen, and water through her roots to the fungi. The fungi passes the nutrients to the roots of seedlings down in the gloom of the forest. They need these nutrients to be able to grow to the sun. If the mother tree is cut down, the entire forest can be compromised. The earth has the right to be healthy. Carbon dioxide is exhaled from our every breath. Compounding larger population of people with our increased carbon emissions and burning fossil fuels, the trees are left with the strenuous job of absorbing too much carbon dioxide. If we point our fingers to the oil companies, they are likely to say we only drill and deliver the fossil fuel to go to the refineries. The refineries might say we only clean the oil, ask the distributor. The gas station attendant might respond with, I only supply the consumer who burns the carbon dioxide, taking away the Earth's right to be healthy. It is the consumer's job to reduce emitting more carbon into the air. We are past the peak amount of oil that can be affordably extracted from the Earth. This is the time to use this energy source to transition to renewable energy. up to the audience to decide whether it's a permacultural example or maybe a stealth marketing campaign or maybe a commemorative idea about the advancements in science where they've connected gut and mental health but uh, basically, it's about sincerity.
started thinking about something that I did. One of the first things that I did when I was a kid, you know, when I was seven years old, was a conversation at the dinner table. My mom was trying to sell my dad on putting new wallpaper in the bathroom. And so I went to bed that night and I had my flashlight under my covers and you know, making notes and drawings. And the next night at dinner, I said, I, 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 want, I, want, I, I want to draw on the wallpaper. And I draw on the wallpaper. So they, you know, they looked at each other and they said, okay, we're going to come down on Monday. So I had the weekend to go nuts. And I did, you know, and I drew faces and I made all kinds of, you know, crazy patterns and what have you. And then she left it up for another month. She had the neighbors in, you know, she had, we, we had a family dinner, so you know, everybody marched in and out of the bathroom. You know, it was a crazy stuff of a seven-year-old kid, but it gave that wallpaper that much more life. And that's exactly what's going on here. Same deal. You know, none of us are doing it for fun. You know, because there's been a lot of positive response, you know. It's, you know, the, the thing of it is, it's like, you know, once you're out here doing something, like when I came out and marked the trees, I had some pink paint, you can see the pink paint, and I had a pole and I'm marking the trees. People start, you know, coming up and asking me what's going on. And, and then, you know, once something starts happening to the tree, it's almost like the first time somebody's looked at that tree. SOS is the International Distress Signal. You know, three dots, three dashes. Three. That then signals distress, which is what the tree was signaling for a very long time. Hands are the most symbolically expressive parts of our body. They also denote the, our actions, you know, that, that's what happens to our hands. And, um, and so they can be both protection as well as destruction. The hands wrapping around the tree were to protect not just the tree but also that relationship that we have with the environment. You know, how can we make it grow? How can we make it thrive? We really wanted to um, show the, the different layers of the tree and the bark. And when you put the first layer of bark off, you see the intricate patterns that the um, Emerald ash mora has made. I always say that nature is the best artist, and so you can see the patterns that are there. And now it still signals that, but also it's th that call to do something about it. You know, to for us to step forward and figure out a way to protect our trees. Um, there is hope. Yep. The plant more, more disease-resistant trees, and do it wisely. The longevity of a parkway tree is about 10 to 20 years and that isn't much because it usually takes about 30 years for a tree to mature. We have short memories. We forget what that ash tree was like and how it afforded shade and clean air. 